Do you remember the biblical story of David and Goliath? When David, a young Jewish shepherd, fought the giant Goliath, he wore heavy armor and was armed with a sword, a spear, and a large shield. The young man had shabby clothes, and his weapons were a sling, a belt made of ox skin, and an ordinary cobblestone. But David won. The stone, which was skillfully fired from the slingshot, broke the giant's head. As the centuries passed, the weapons became more and more formidable, and it would seem that the David and Goliath situation could never happen again. Defense systems had become so advanced that to break through them, even more advanced and expensive attack systems were needed. But then came drones, which at a cost of a few thousand dollars destroy tanks for millions of dollars, pass air defense systems for hundreds of millions of dollars, and have even begun to threaten aircraft carriers for billions of dollars. How to fight them effectively? In today's video, we'll tell you about it. Spoiler, the Houthis attacking merchant ships in the Red Sea. Get ready. The problem of having to use missiles costing hundreds of thousands of dollars to destroy targets that are cheap up to $1,000 has been felt by Israel for the first time in all its acuteness. It's forced to use Tamir missiles from the Iron Dome anti-aircraft system to destroy cheap Palestinian Qasem missiles made in clandestine workshops. The cost of each is $150,000, so the terrorists firing 1,000 rockets incur a cost of $1 million, while Israel incurs a cost of $150 million. These are not comparable costs. And for example, the REM-116 rolling airframe missile, which is on the world's most modern aircraft carrier Gerald Ford, was already estimated in 2014 at $998,000. Now its price tag is probably past the million dollar mark. Now imagine a swarm of 100 kamikaze drones attacking an aircraft carrier. How much would it cost the US people to neutralize that attack? A billion dollars. And such a swarm, and even controlled by artificial intelligence, this is no longer a fantasy, but a reality. There's one more problem besides the incomparable cost. With the help of cheap drones, you can easily overload the air defense system. So when all the anti-aircraft missiles are fired, the drones keep flying and flying. This is what happened, for example, on October 7, 2023, when Hamas fired more than 2,200 rockets into Israel from the Gaza Strip. This resulted in the Iron Dome being breached and killing at least five people. And if the defenses of the $13 billion Gerald Ford are breached, yes, one or two or even ten drones will not sink the ship itself, but what will happen if at least one of them hits the F-35C standing on the deck, fueled and fully armed? And there will be other planes of the same kind standing nearby. A huge fire on the deck, dozens of deaths, and the warship would be put out of commission for a long time. Realizing this problem, scientists and engineers of many countries, primarily the United States and Israel, began to develop laser weapons. Its use promises many benefits. First, the cost of one pulse of a combat laser, taking into account all the costs, is estimated at one or two thousand dollars. So it's comparable to the cost of the cheapest drone. Secondly, it's practically impossible to overload the laser system. It's limited, in fact, only by the power reserve. But if, for example, it's a nuclear reactor that can work for decades, we can talk about an unlimited resource for laser weapons. There's a third, undoubted advantage of laser weapons, ease of aiming. There's no need for any complicated ballistic calculations or complex guidance systems. In fact, it's enough to point the laser at a visible target and press the trigger. In a moment, the laser beam will stab the target. Yes, laser weapons have one major drawback. It works in line of sight. The laser beam can't see over the horizon. Taking into account the curvature of the Earth, the line of sight distance on open ground and at sea is estimated at 5 kilometers. But the higher you raise the laser above the surface, the line of sight distance increases. For example, the height of the deck of the aircraft carrier Gerald Ford above the waterline, so actually sea level is 250 feet or 76 meters. If the laser units place 10 meters above the deck, the line of sight distance is 34 kilometers. Take away a third of this distance due to scattering of the laser beam in the atmosphere, and you get that a laser from an aircraft carrier can operate at a distance of up to 20 kilometers. Drones fly at speeds of up to 200 kilometers an hour. For example, with such speed fly Iranian Shahids, which the Russian troops use to nightmare Ukrainian cities. Thus, 20 kilometers in 360 seconds. Let it take one second to destroy one drone. For a 300 to 500 kilowatt laser beam, it's quite realistic. 
and another second to redirect to another drone. Consequently, in those 363 seconds, the laser warfare system will destroy 180 drones. For $2,000 per shot, the total cost would be $360,000. If Gerald Ford had fought back with RIM-116 rolling airframe missiles, the cost would have been $180 million. In addition, the attack would not have been thwarted. One RIM-116 rolling airframe missile launcher includes 21 missiles, and the aircraft carrier Gerald Ford has only two of them. That's 42 missiles. After that, reloading is required. We don't know how many total missiles for the RIM-116 on board the ship, but we suspect that not a very large number. Therefore, laser weapons at the moment are an alternative way to combat a large number of drones. So what kind of combat lasers can be put on warships? In 2021, the U.S. Navy tested the Laser Weapon System Demonstrator, or LWSD Mark II Mod Zero for short, a 150-kilowatt laser mounted on the amphibious assault ship USS Portland. It was fired at a surface target, a gunboat. The command of the 5th Fleet, based on the Middle East, assessed the test as successful. It's noteworthy that the test took place in the Gulf of Aden, so in the waters adjacent to Yemen and the Red Sea. So in the area where now the Houthis are attacking merchant ships with the help of Iranian missiles and drones, and where the Operation Guardian of Order is being conducted, during which the Houthis are also attacking military ships. It was also revealed that Lockheed Martin announced on August 1st, 2023, that it had achieved a record power of 500 kilowatts or 0.5 megawatts for laser weapon prototypes. If we take into account that the heavy weight and dimensions of such installations are not a problem for ships, we can conclude that the main technical problems of laser weapons capable of destroying unmanned aerial vehicles and even small boats have been solved. Speaking of boats, as the practice of the Russian-Ukrainian war has shown, uncrewed boats with 200 to 300 kilograms of explosives controlled with the help of Starlink system and strategic UAVs like RQ-4 Global Hawk, which perform target designations, are very formidable weapons. Recently, the Russian large landing ship Caesar Kunikov, displacing 4,050 tons and costing $85 million, was destroyed with the help of such boats. Before that, another Russian warship was destroyed in the same way. A kamikaze drone is a very difficult target to hit as it rises only a half a meter above the water and is extremely difficult to hit, but not for a laser beam. And can a laser beam destroy missiles? After all, the same Houthis attack ships not only with drones but also with missiles. And if we talk about a possible confrontation between the US, Russia, and China at sea, it's missiles that'll be the main weapon of defeat. The same Russians can hit with their hypersonic Zircon missiles, which at the moment cannot be intercepted by any anti-missile defense system based on anti-aircraft missiles. Of course, burning through the hull of a missile, especially a hypersonic missile designed for huge aerodynamic and thermal loads, is still an unrealistic task. But all missiles have one weak point. Achilles heel, the optical system or locator. If we're talking about radio electronic homing, hitting elements of these can likely become the main method of fighting hypersonic missiles. When can we expect combat lasers to be installed on American ships? In our opinion, the main problem is energy installations. For example, to test laser weapons on the same landing ship, USS Portland, it was necessary to install a 150 kilowatt diesel generator on it. Of course, this is not a big problem, but it does take some time, and for sure, laser weapons will be installed on prospective warships. According to U.S. media, the design of the U.S. Navy's advanced frigate FFGX includes a requirement to install a 150-kilowatt combat laser under the control of the Combat's 21 combat system. There's also information about the program of installation of 150-kilowatt laser weapons on universal landing ships of the San Antonio type, and the RHEL Ruggedized High Energy Laser Program with a power of 150 kilowatts. A special mention should be made of the American project of Free Electron Laser, Free Electron Lays, abbreviated as FEL, which is being developed in the interests of the U.S. Navy. Laser weapons of this type have significant differences compared to other types of lasers. Its radiation is generated by a monoenergetic beam of electrons moving in a system of deflecting electric or magnetic fields. By varying the energy of the electron beam as well as the strength of the magnetic field and the distance between the magnets, it's possible to change the frequency of laser radiation within a wide range, producing output radiation in the range from X-rays to microwaves. 
Free electron lasers are characterized by large dimensions, which makes it difficult to place them on small size carriers. In this sense, large surface ships are the optimal carriers for lasers of this type. In conclusion, a few more words about the aircraft carrier Gerald Ford. It's equipped with two Bechtel A1B nuclear reactors. They are much more advanced than previously used on aircraft carriers such as Nimitz Westinghouse A4W reactors. Most importantly, they are powerful, 700 megawatts versus 550 megawatts. So the power is increased by a quarter. The two Bechtel A1B reactors produce 1400 megawatts versus 1100 megawatts from the two A4Ws. And this extra quarter, so 300 megawatts or 3000 kilowatts, is more than enough to power a laser installation and more than one. It's known that the aircraft carrier Gerald Ford left the Mediterranean Sea in early January this year and went to its base in Norfolk, Virginia, maybe to be outfitted with laser weapons. What about the other U.S. aircraft carriers like the Nimitz? They don't have excess electrical power, and it's hard to put the necessary generating capacity on them. First of all, it's difficult, but still probably possible. Secondly, let's not forget about the other ships that are part of the aircraft carrier strike group, and there are carriers and cruisers. Surely one or two such ships can be converted, as was done on the landing ship USS Portland. Well, we'll just have to wait. And we think we'll have to wait a while. The need for laser weapons on warships is overdue, and U.S. commanders are well aware of that. Once again, the U.S. must reassess who is the master of the world's oceans. This is the end of our video. Thank you for watching. We'll be glad if you in the comments state your thoughts on the topic we raised, as well as put a like on the video and subscribe to our channel. It helps to promote it so that interesting content is seen by as many people as possible. Have fun, and see you soon!